Welcome to this podcast based on the teachings of the Danish writer Martinus. This particular podcast is a collaboration between the Martinus Cosmology Podcast and Cosmology Podden from Sweden. I'm the host of the Martinus Cosmology Podcast and my name is Mary McGovern and my co-host today is Mikael Söderberg from Cosmology Podden in Sweden. Welcome, Mikael. Thank you, Mary. It's nice to be here. And our guest today is Nikolai Pilgor Peterson, a Dane, who has written, uh, among other things, a PhD, including the works of Martinus. Welcome, Nikolai. Thanks. I'm very pleased to be here as well. Uh, Nikolai, maybe you could, we could start with you telling us a, a, a bit about yourself. Who are you? What's your background? How did you get interested in Martinus cosmology? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I teach mathematics and history, and I've done some yeah and, and philosophy as well. <laughs> and I've done some academic work, uh, a PhD, um, and I also try to present some of the philosophical ideas to a broader audience. I've written a couple of books and I've done some yeah, some videos on YouTube and stuff, yeah. And as for Martinus, I uh, yeah, I encountered him when I was in my late twenties or so and uh, I found his view very yeah, very interesting. Maybe his his world view, world picture, yeah. Uh, until then I had well I hadn't thought that much about <laughs> the bigger questions, uh, the nature of reality and and those kind of things. I, I studied philosophy later, so at that point I hadn't really uh, delved into philosophy yet. So um it 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 was it was a very interesting and, and different take on all those questions and I, I started the, um, taking interest in it. Yes. And and what particular issues uh that Martinus took up were you interested in? Yeah, so I until then I hadn't well I hadn't thought too much about it. I, I simply assumed that you know the science has had the the answers uh, and you know people were some people were religious and well that was fine, but now we we kind of moved beyond that point. So uh, that was a fairly, you know, a common view I think. And and then I um I read about some studies on, on near-death experiences, some of the research uh, in that field, and I thought, well, that was that was very strange because if there's something to this, then things might be entirely different than you know than what people generally think. Right? And then I I started you know, reading more alternative uh, stuff, and I encountered Martinus, and he had this. Well, all encompassing worldview. Right? He has this incredible explanatory power, uh, and it was um, I haven't encountered a, 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 like a, a metaphysical system or a worldview of that magnitude in Wales and in the history of philosophy. So that was very interesting. Yeah, mm. the, the magnitude and the consistency of the of the entire world uh, image and the explanatory power. Yeah. But as I understand it, you, you encountered Martinus before you started to study philosophy. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of kindled my interest in the yeah, in, in in philosophy in a more broad way. Yeah. So I started study. I, I studied history and mathematics, and I was teaching those subjects, and then I studied philosophy afterwards. Yeah, uh, and and I tried to in my PhD also and some other works. I tried to kind of. Uh, test Martinus' views or perhaps compare them somewhat to other philosophical views and some of the contemporary philosophical problems and, and stuff like that. Did you find it helpful to to have the background uh, in Martinus' teachings when you when you read about different philosophical philosophical uh, theories and 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 like that did you think it was easier to understand them from from that perspective or, or did you have to separate separate them so to speak yeah well that too yeah two two 
answers to this, right? Yeah. So one view is that Martinus, he presents his metaphysics or his world image. World, world, picture, world, world picture. picture, yeah. yeah. And that's kind of, that's, that's one particular metaphysical system. And then there are other philosoph- other philosophers, they present other metaphysical systems, right? So, and then you can do, you can compare them or analyze in different ways. Uh, and the other approach is to say that, okay, Martinus, he has provided the the overall framework for this. So when you read other philosophers' metaphysics, then you can kind of evaluate them against Martinus's views in a way, right? So I'm, um, well, Martinus's views, they kind of, they, um, they resonate with me in a way, <laughs> but I'd like to, yeah, as I mentioned, I'd like to test them more thoroughly, analytically, and more give, test them, press them a bit because his 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 arguments or his way of of uh, yeah of grounding his his views are well, they're not perhaps on par with uh, con- contemporary. Uh, analytical um, standards, perhaps, right? So, um, yeah, so I did use it as an overall framework, uh, but also as one amongst other uh, views on the fundamental nature of reality. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, that was a bit long winded, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I can say we, we just had a study group uh, here before, and we are a little group about uh, seven, eight people. and. and we discussed a little bit today, uh, and we are reading an, an article about um, by Martinez, and 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 one of the students said that uh, well, Martinez says we 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 are not supposed to believe in what he says. We we have to test it uh, in relation to our own experiences, and and he the one who said that he he come from a more materialistic background. I think he wasn't. Machine engineer, engineer, <laughs> engineer, it? yeah, or some sort. And he, he, well, he said, I can't really, I can't see the the pure logic in in this. I can't see that this is a science of some sort. Uh, if he said I, I, I should believe it. Well, that's fine. But he says it is a science, and that I, I can't, like some, I can't really see that. So, so in a way, you are try to test that or, or set, set it in relation to the yeah, you might say. academic uh, philosophy. Yeah. yeah, because it's, yeah, Martinus, he says, well, I present a, a, a logical world uh, picture, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he stresses the, the, the logic part of it. And when he uses the word logic, I think it's, he, it's consistent, right? So and and that's a pretty big thing because it's so all encompassing. So it's it's a big feat to even <laughs> present um, a, a system or a model of reality that encompasses everything and is still consistent. Right. So that's I think that is part of what he means when he says logic, because usually when you say logic, you mean it in a more like a, a mathematical sense, right? If you have A, then follows B, perhaps with necessity. But some of sometimes when Martinus presents his arguments, it's his conclusions doesn't follow with necessity, not with logical necessity, and that's perhaps what confuses. Yeah, some it's, it's a bit confusing sometimes. Yeah. I think he uses the word logic or logique in Danish in, in somewhat broader sense than the specific. Term logic in in like a mathematical sense, or and it, he has another definition of logic than any I have encountered. He he says that um, logic is the same as love. Yeah. Um, uh, he says, and I quote here: um, "Being loving is the same as being truly logical and thus perfect. Yeah. Being unloving is being illogical and correspondingly imperfect." And he, he interprets this um, saying from the Bible, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. He interprets it as blessed are the logical, 
where they conform to the world plan and therefore have no unloving or selfish kinds of thoughts, desires or wishes that collide with it, and thus cannot experience the pain of them being crushed against the steadfastness of the world plan. So it's it's a rather yeah. different uh, definition of yeah. logic than I have met before. Yeah. It's, it's the same as love. It's um, being in accordance with the world plan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the world plan is love. Yeah, right. So it's yes, yeah, because yeah, everything fits together perfectly, and and it's that it's that kind of logic. It's how everything works perfectly. Mm-hmm. And if you if you understand that, then you are a loving being. So mm-hmm. these two things are so. Yeah, in a way, your 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 ethical I don't know level, perhaps a moral <laughs> moral level. Uh, you 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 have to reach a certain altruistic state before you can even accept this kind of logic. You might say, right. yeah. So it's, it, in that sense, it's very it's very different. You can't just deduce it rationally. No, it's not a sort of cold logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's but not it's, cold it's, logic. It, it's very much connected with a warm heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah the warm heart is a pre 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 pre. pre- Prerequisite, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prerequisite yeah. for even accepting his his arguments and conclusions. I think mm. his premises. Mm. And usually they they don't work like that in the yeah, academic yeah, exactly. Field, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. they probably would think that this is some kind of religion or modern modern yeah. religion yeah, yeah, yeah. of some sort. Yeah. Okay. They would. When I first was doing some of the academic work and I did a bigger thesis and I presented it and then the the, the professor he, he just he saw the name Martinus and then he said oh no. well he didn't say it but afterwards he said hey when you came in and I saw that name I thought oh no <laughs> and then he said all right then it was okay after all but you know just so just the name afterwards he said oh I didn't know there was so much philosophy uh, in Martinus as well mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so the the general perception is that is some kind of Perhaps new age religious stuff. I think, mm. Yeah. Mm. but it, it it's interesting that that he said that because it's true that Martinez he, he talks about reality, he talks about knowledge, and he talks about free will. And I suppose that that's some topics that uh, yeah. relates to yeah. traditional philosophy yeah. as well. Yeah, 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 that's traditional philosophy because <laughs> <laughs> most of the I don't know, more mainstream contemporary philosophy is much more technical in nature and it's it, it's within a, a, a materialistic framework that the assumption simply is that what exists fundamentally is the physical and that's it pretty much. So there's been, in recent years, things have begun to perhaps open a little bit, up, but... The overall assumption is that it's, uh, you know, it, well, this is far. Right? You can't really, yeah. you can really, you, you can't really take it seriously. I think, for perhaps, yeah, for a big part of the the uh, academic world, that's the case. And your thesis was very well received, wasn't it? Yes, uh, they found it interesting, and I think they like that. Something new is happening, and new perspectives, and that. So, in principle, that's a good thing. You know, everyone agrees on that. In practice, I think they found it interesting, but I also think that many said, "Yeah, that's fine. You know, interesting, but you know, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit too far out." Yeah. Okay. Um, but there have been, yeah, <clears throat> but there have been. Steering, so there have been some movements toward a, 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 a broader approach to the questions. Yeah, yeah. So the question of the fundamental nature of reality—that's traditionally that's a, a, a key philosophical question. But in contemporary philosophy, it's it's not it's not present very. It's not in the forefront. No, no, for, no. no, it's, it's not in the forefront. No, because mm. it's yeah. It's assumed that you know the material world is the fundamental. Yeah, and we have one life. 
Yeah, and it ends yeah, yeah, when yeah. we die. Yeah, yeah. so because <laughs> even questioning that, that you know, that brings you uh, <laughs> much perhaps too close to religious points of view. It, so if you want to do an academic career, you you have to you know mm-hmm. you have to watch your steps and, and that regard. I think. And isn't there a lot of research into near death experiences and the whole concept of reincarnation? Isn't it the, the University of Virginia in America? Yeah. Yeah. There are some there are some, there are some places, pockets, some but... but I think that in in the in the general you now within the the mainstream framework, people think that you know, they're a bit crazy, right? All right, mm-hmm. they just do their things and that's fine. Yeah, but they they do serious research. They do serious research. And they do and yeah. publish papers and stuff. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's not within mainstream. No, and I guess it's very hard to get funding for that kind of research. Yeah. Yeah, when well, yeah, when I did my PhD, I just yeah, I did it by myself. But otherwise, you have to receive a grant, and and so you have to to you have to present your project, and that project has to you know it has to be of interest to those providing the grants. Uh, so it has to have some utility, typically, or you have to do applied philosophy, or uh, you know how do we handle a uh, global war something like that right okay that's uh, also philosophical question. yeah you could do there's a moral question so uh, oh yeah there's some, some different ways of, so so you have this applied philosophy or, or kind of practical philosophy in a way these are the more theoretical questions the traditional questions and they are they are not uh, yeah they're not on the forefront at the <laughs> moment now is it possible to research about how can mankind create peace? Is is that a sort of f- philosophical question? Yeah, I think that 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 would that would be much easier to get grants, you know. <laughs> okay. But not not perhaps world peace, but you know, how do we? Yeah, how how do because these are concrete problems that mm-hmm. we need to handle, right? Yeah. And and that's what people want to spend their money on. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's understandable, mm. perhaps. I was thinking that the the, the more historical uh, philosophers mm. like Plato and, yeah. and others, yeah. did they believe in a more reincarnation and, and a, another kind of reality, or, or or were they also materialistic in no. their worldview? No. Materialism is a historically it's a fairly new. Uh, position so it perhaps in the yeah in the 19th century it kind of got traction with the rise of the natural sciences uh, um, and starting a bit earlier but the ability to explain the natural phenomena um, you know naturally <laughs> without the Religious, yeah, we sort. Yeah, we are religious, but also specifically by observing the behavior of the material world. So, the, the laws of nature. So, this is a materialistic understanding of reality, and and this um, increased ability to explain more and more. It has led to perhaps the you know the conclusion, perhaps that then we can explain everything from the way the the physical world, um, yeah, that behaves, but you know, well, it functions or works. So. They were impressed by the natural sciences, yeah, and they were impressed. But it, the natural sciences, they well, they did explain a lot, and and there were huge benefits from this. Um, and but but if if you go further back um, in the seventeenth century, Descartes, for example, he had the the idea of of dualism. That the human being possesses a body and a soul, right? And that's a more traditional understanding. Uh, and there's also the concept of idealism, that the physical world is is an ex- we ex- what we experience as physical objects are not uh, existing in themselves. We we experience them. Perhaps it's something else that appears to us, and Martinus would probably say that, uh, in a specific way, but it's not, the physical world is not the fundamental, um, it's not what is fundamental uh, in reality. Uh, And 
And that's a kind of acceptable view in some fields of philosophy, or? It, there are proponents today, but it's a very, uh, <laughs> so there, are, there are a few of them, because it's, when you claim that this table doesn't really exist, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit <laughs> against common sense, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of people would agree that the table does not exist plainly as we experience it. This is it's made up of atoms. It's made up mm -hmm. of atoms, right? And 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 there are it's in between the atoms there's there's just vacuum. So it's almost simply nothing. But we experience it as matter that we can kind of feel and touch, but in 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 reality, I don't know, but it, yeah, contemporary physics would say that matter doesn't really exist, right? It's we we just perceive it as as a, as substantial solid, a yeah. solid, a solid. Yeah. 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 And Martinez says that nothing is as is as it appears to be. Yeah. Mm. So you could look at this table on from many perspectives. At the moment, we we see this table is supporting our microphones and so on. So it's has a certain physicality. But if we looked into the microcosmos that it made, is made up, it's particles in empty yeah. space, and most of it's empty space. Yeah. I think that, yeah, contemporary science would would agree completely on this. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Then, yeah. So, but Rick, you, you asked about Plato as well. And at least if interpreting him you know, in a, as has been as has been done traditionally, he he uh, he believes in reincarnation. Yeah. So it's a matter of interpretation, but uh, he yeah, he believes that that uh, the human being has a soul and and that there'll be another life after this one. So according to him, life is not life is not about getting rich or, or even married. <laughs> it's about uh, achieving knowledge and insights and become a better better person. It's like Martina. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it has a lot of similarities. Like Martinez, yeah. He has the cave pa paral parallel. Um, yeah. Uh, the uh, parables. Uh, yeah, a parable. Yeah. A parable of the cave. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah where he, yeah. You described it uh, in your lecture you had here for one year yeah. ago. Yeah. I think you had a picture of the yeah. people in the cave and when they. Maybe got you could up. explain those that for those who don't understand. Yeah, okay, so so there are some people uh, in a cave, and they are chained in the cave, and they've been chained in that way for their entire life. So they they never seen anything than the back wall, perhaps, or the back of the cave. Mm -hmm. um, and then behind them, there's a there's a, a fire, a bonfire, or something. And then there are some other people with the uh, gears. And the fire makes those figure um, casting shadows on the wall in the cave. Mm. So the chain people, the only thing they can see are the are the shadows of the signs of figures behind mm. them. So when they see a shadow of a figure of a tree, they say, "Oh, there's a tree." For example, and they never experienced anything else than this. That's their entire world of experience. And then one day, one of these uh, People, he escapes the chains and he climbs out of the cave. And then he, he, when his eyes have adjusted to the light, he um, mm. he sees a real tree and he says, "Oh, this is fantastic! You know, this, it has color and it's I don't know, the tree is in some whatever." And it is, and he can even see the sun and he can see the real world. And then he climbs down to his friends and say, "Oh, this is not the true reality. You think this is the tree? This is just a, you know, a shadow." And they say to him, "What? You're crazy! <laughs> Everybody know that this is a tree, right?" Okay. So, so Plato he he tells this parable. Uh, so we are the we are the ones in the cave, right? We think that what we experience with our senses is the deepest or the true reality, but it's mere. It's just shadows. It's just yes. It's just poor replications or images of a more fundamental or true or uh, and perhaps good reality in a sense. And so so the cave, it's not a, it doesn't exist in a physical sense, but it's um it's climbing out of the cave is 
a an an intellectual journey or an in, a journey of insight or or on on knowledge. It's it's understanding reality in a deeper sense, and that's that's the way to get out of the the cave. Mathematics, you would say, is one step, and philosophy, and then yeah, it's. It's also a matter of interpretation how you get, you know, all the way out of the cave, perhaps mysticism. Um, so in that so if if he is interpreted within the framework of Matimus's thoughts, then it pretty much aligns with Matimus much of his stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's so, interesting. Yeah, so if yeah, if 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 Matinus's world picture is the premise, then you could easily argue that Plato he he had you know, she was pretty ahead was of, pretty, of his time. Yeah, ahead of his time, and perhaps even ahead of today's time as well. Yeah. <laughs> ahead of materials, I yes. yeah. And and we don't see him as a religious uh, the, theorist or something. Plato, he is a philosopher. Yeah, it is. So. But I think today, a lot of people working on his, you know, yeah. analyzing his works and and but but. Not a lot of academic philosophers take his th- thoughts serious in the sense that they think that he actually describes reality as it oh, is. Right? Yeah. So you can do you know, historical research and, and interpretations, uh, but I don't think he he had. And I don't think people today really believe that he presents reality uh, as it truly is. So d- does his his work have any impact on the personal lives of the researchers? Plato's? Yeah. I think perhaps um, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. So there were people who were much more open to the idea of idealism, the idea that reality is not just the physical stuff that we think it is. So about a hundred years ago, or perhaps around the year nineteen hundred or something, then materialism really uh, kind of everybody became materialists almost. So the, mm-hmm. the 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 ideas of idealism and they were like pushed pushed aside. But I think before that, I think some of them who studied Plato, they they thought he he had. He has something to offer. Mm. You no, know, he has. He's got something here, mm. and I think that's a good chance that he has. Silly Hammond. Yeah. 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 Well, Mary, uh, should we talk a little bit about consciousness, or what do you think? Yes, yes. Um, you have talked previously about um, what you have called the easy problem of consciousness <laughs> and the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah. And yeah, well, it, yeah, it's not my my terms, but it's, it's not your terms. No, no okay. Philosophy called channels. I understand the easy problem of consciousness is correct, connected with the brain. That the brain has certain functions and so on. And um, I remember hearing you asking the question: Is the brain necessary? Yeah. And I myself have worked with a teenage boy who had almost no brain. He, he only had a few brain cells just under the skull. The rest was full of body fluid. Yeah. But he he worked as my interpreter when I was working in Germany. So he was totally fluent in English and German. He he had no there was no lack of intellectual ability. There were some problems with growth and coordination, but um, intellectually he was absolutely fine. So um, so I wondered, yeah, what's the brain for if we if we can have a normal life with so little brain? Yeah. Um, but it is extraordinary, yeah. And I think the a, a paper was written in the in the eighties with a title along those lines, do is our brain even necessary or something like that. And and that was yeah, that was based on studies on the on, on, on people, yeah, with the with the with this water on the brain. Yeah, and it yeah. has some hydro in, hydroencephalite. Yeah, there's some the, yeah, or something. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and even people with were lacking, I think perhaps ninety five percent of the brain uh, mass. They were functioning pretty well. It was it was very yeah. interesting. This. But the the part where conscious is 
uh, assumed to be located. That's the kind of the outer part of the brain. And and I think most of the missing brain mass or cells, it was from other parts of the brain. But still, perhaps 90% or whatever of the brain was missing. And and one of the one of the people mentioned in the study, he I think he's, he was a math student or so. I think he studied mathematics at university and he had a, a very high IQ. So it was, it was quite a... Yeah, yeah extraordinary. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, I visited a whole department at the hospital in Germany where um, they had all these uh, children and teenagers with this uh, illness which left them with very little brain. Um, but they, they function normally. As I said, they had some coordination difficulties yeah. and but it was partly due to this very enlarged head. And bal- balancing a very large head on a normal body, that was a problem. And that's what I was there to help them with. But, so because uh, of the water, their heads, they grew? Their heads uh, expanded and expanded uh, until one of the, the fathers of one of the patients uh, invented a shunt that could drain away the, oh. the excess fluid so you could stop this yeah. degeneration of the brain. Yeah. But um, there was no degeneration of intellectual uh, that, functions. Yeah, and that's... That seems uh, difficult to um, explain within a maternalistic yeah. framework. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because a lot of work has been done in mapping what parts of the brain are associated yeah. with yes. various activities. Yes. And that is also true. Yeah. So how does it work? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah. So, yeah, so the, 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 the heart, the soft, was it the soft problems, I think? Are they, was it the easy, easy, sorry, easy on the hard, <laughs> the easy problems of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. That's that's mapping. That's mapping the brain. So which part of the brain um, do which? Uh, I don't know. Have have which functions? So yeah. So that would be termed the 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 easy problems because that that could be done empirically. You can just you know test the brain, and if if something happens here, then this happens in your. You can measure it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can measure it. Yeah. So, mm. so you can you can find correlations there. So, but the the hard problem is um, why do consciousness even exist at all? So, so according to the materialist point of view, what exists fundamentally is the physical, is the brain, and the brain somehow I don't know generates or produces or. Mm, um, results in experience existing. Some kind of epiphenomenon phenomenon or something. Yeah, yeah. But 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 how does something unconscious <laughs> like the physical world, how how can it generate or how can it make something how can it make consciousness come into existence? So that's a that's a very big leap. Mm. So Mental phenomena and physical phenomena; those are the two most, I don't know, most. They're, they are so different. We don't know anything that's further apart from each other than these two phenomena. And still, here the claim is that one of them can kind of create the other or make the other come into existence. So, it's, if there's nothing conscious in the physical world, how can our brain create consciousness? Mm. So, so. Why, why do we do we even experience? Why are we not just like robots? Because <laughs> everything happens in the brain anyway. We have all these uh, uh, impulses and chemical reactions, and it governs uh, our body and everything. It happens according to the materialist point of view. Everything is we have everything in our brain. So why experience? Why this epiphenomenon? Right, mm-hmm. that's at least one way of approaching it. Because it, we can't, we can't um, uh, affect what happens in the brain anyway. So usually, if you have a, a physical uh, effect, you you need a physical cause. Things don't happen without any causes. So what happens in our brain happens because of previous physical causes. So we can't. Uh, something happens happening within my conscious a thought it can't affect anything within my brain according to to a materialist 
interpretation of reality. Mm. How, how should that be possible? Because it's not physical. So you cannot you cannot affect physical stuff except by 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 physical stuff. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Yeah. So does materialistic science say that thoughts are immaterial? So and it depends on what you mean by the by the, by the term thoughts, right? So if you're a neuroscientist, you perhaps you would equate the two and say, well, a thought is simply this brain process. That's that's simply what a thought is. Right? So that would be explaining in, in terms of the like, if you only look at the physical world, that would you say that, that that's a thought? But the problem is the the experience of the thought, mm. experiencing it. Ever. Usually, consciousness is, I don't know if it's defined, but it's described as, you. I'm conscious because there's something it is like to be me, and there's something it is like to be you, and therefore you're conscious. But presumably, there's nothing it's like to be this table, so this table is not conscious. And it's, I don't know, it's a bit... I don't know, windy path, but why is there something it is like to be me? Why, why do I even experience anything? Because the atoms in my brain are not, they're not different from the atoms, uh, I don't know, in water or coal or in an uh, apple or whatever. But still, I'm able to experience. I have this feeling of being a center of the experience of subjectivity. So experiencing joy or yeah sorrow or yeah yeah and yeah but even more fundamentally experiencing at all mm -hmm. even that I'm experiencing instead of it's just all being the laws of nature just happening because mm -hmm. the there are no reasons really that we should experience anything because mm -hmm. according to a materialist point of view because what what exists is the physical world and it just mm -hmm. No, it works like a clockwork. It just happens. Mm -hmm. The laws of nature just works. Actually, I have a, I have a theory that um, you could say that Martinus's entire work is based on the theme of the experience of life. Like the first section in Lewis Bo is, uh, if I summarize it, he says that every living being is subject to the experience of life. That's the first sentence in his work. And for me, the whole of Lewis Bo, the Book of Life all 3,000 pages, is explaining this experience of life. Yes. What is the experience of life? Yes. And he has this three-part model yes. of the living being with this eternal I, yes. an eternal ability to create an experience, an internally changing organism and consciousness. So um, that's another model than yeah. the scientific or philosophical model. Yeah, it is. And that's, what, yeah, when I did my PhD, it's other way, that's, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Born with some of the of those ideas, yeah, specifically, yeah, because that would that would be an entirely different way of approaching the problem, because the problem of consciousness or the hard problem of consciousness, it it's present because of the premise of materialism. So if the premise is that what exists is the physical, and then we have to explain consciousness, then we we encounter this problem. Yeah. But if we turn it around and say. What exists is experience. That's the most fundamental thing. Okay, then we experience this table as if it was is we we. Th it seems to us that the table has independent ex existence, but that's just an experience of the table. So that would be a more realistic approach, and and that would match Martinus's approach. I think because he would say, well, the the table is simply the appearance of something. There's something uh, below, or there's something behind it that appears to us as the table. Um, and what is it then that appears to us at the table? That's a big question, right? Mm. Because the problem is then that if we if we kind of dismiss our empirical. Uh, um, you know that that we can engage the world empirically, or that we can reach the world empirically. Then we have a, a problem, right? Mm. 
So, so the natural scientists, they will say, all right, we have our empirical method, and because of that, we can gain knowledge about the world, about reality. But now we say, no, you cannot. You only have the experience of the table, but in reality, it's something else. Well, then we have a problem because we, and that's Kant's, uh, Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher. He would say, yeah, that's, that, that's how it is. Das Ding an sich, he would say, the thing in itself, we, we can never know it, he would say. Yeah. Uh, we can only know the, das, das, das Ding für uns, how it is. Yeah. 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 And that, that matches Matthias somewhat. Matthias, he would say, yeah, but we can know something. Yeah. Not the thing in itself, right? Yeah. We can't really describe it. That's why he uses X. Uh, at least we can describe it in detail, but we can say something. And we can say a lot about the appearances of the processes of the manifestation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. so, so the content of our world of experience, it follows certain um, patterns and yeah, that kind of rules or it's a big system. Uh, and that's, in the end, that's what perhaps is of interest, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because our experience is our world. Yeah. And uh, I think central to our experience of life is our senses of what Matthias calls our set of senses. And he describes senses or our ability to sense as something that evolves. So that um, uh, at the moment I see this table as something solid. Um, and theoretically I can understand, well, it's particles in empty space and I know it's from a, a tree and so on. Um, but with cosmic senses, I would see the world entirely differently. So our perception of the world is very much um, governed by the, the, sets, the senses we have at a particular stage in evolution. So a plant might experience life differently to a lion, and a lion will be experienced differently to a human being. And human beings at different levels of evolution will experience life differently. Well, that's a good point. And, and the, the concept that consciousness has to do with there's something it is like to be me, for example. Uh, that that idea was presented in a paper called "What's It Like to Be a Bat?" Actually, a bat. So, the, so one of the points was that yeah, we we can't imagine how it must be to be a bat because it, it can't really see like we do. It has I don't know some uh, some some stuff, some sign, sound, some way of, of navigating and using sound, right? So it's the experience of the world must be entirely different from ours, and we we can't even imagine how it must be. But still, there's a way it is like to be a bat. So it is conscious. So that would that would fit that point pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then, as in traditionally, there are two ways of achieving knowledge. There's um, empirical knowledge, like the sciences. You know, we use our senses; we can see and we can measure things. And then there's the, the rational approach, we can think like the, the logic. So we can attempt to gain insights by thinking. So traditionally, these are the two only ways of, of uh, achieving knowledge, so empirically or rationally. And then, but then what Tidus says, well, that's a third way, right? that's it, intuition. Mm -hmm. And he will say only when the ability to achieve knowledge through intuition is sufficiently I don't know, developed or, or uh, you need to reach a certain level because you can even, before you can even accept my my, my concepts or my ideas. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with this third um, kind of uh, yeah, can, can any knowledge yeah, of, of um, yeah, a third way of uh, yeah, getting uh, yeah, Kenos is one of those really different insight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. So, so, and, and I think that has to cognition do. is a technical term, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not commonly used in, 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 in philosophy. You call it epistemology. Hmm. So usually there are two ways here. There are, yeah, to gain knowledge, I can. Yeah, yeah. That would yeah, be. I think. And I think that that's one of the big problems when you talk about Martinus in contemporary academic philosophy, because the other two ways are, you know, accepted, of course. And then if you say, but there's a third way, right? And then you just know the truth. Then people will say, ah, that sounds a bit there. Uh, and you can only know the truth when you reach a certain level. 
So if you don't accept my arguments, then it's just because you know you have rest of It's a sort of prem premise. Yes. The premise is yes. You have to believe there is a third way. Yeah, yeah like intuition. If and if you don't, well everything falls apart. Yeah. But, but, you, but if you have developed intuition um, couldn't you say that's also empirical knowledge, but it's from the point of view of another set of senses? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yes. But the problem is that usually when we talk about empirical knowledge, we will say, okay, there's a table here. I can see the table, and you can see the table, and you can see the table. So we can agree that there's a table, at least we perceive it as a table. But if I say, now I've experienced this, and I know it's true. Okay. Well, you haven't experienced it. So... So how, how can you know that it's true? I, I can just tell you that I know it's true, but you don't have the sense of truthfulness. Or you, you can you can be certain it's true. You can't validate it. No, I can't no. take it in any way. No. But she, she will say, yeah, that's exactly how it is. Mm. Only when you reach, you know, when you get far enough, then you will, by experiencing it yourself, you will see, or not even see, but you will know that this is the truth. Mm. But until then, then, then you, yeah, at one point, you could perhaps accept some theoretical stuff, but to you re before reaching you at that point, then we just dismiss it. And, and that's not how the academic world works. Then you have to present your arguments. And in principle, if the argument is strong enough, everybody would, would buy it. I agree to it. Oh, sorry. You, you talked about Earlier on, I think about these research about uh, near-death experiences and or, or the like, where they can uh, see where heart patients have been unconscious and and they can talk about um, things they have seen under their operation. Mm. And uh, uh, are are these um, results sort of influencing the 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 ordinary science or, or the philosophy, or is it just a very special branch within the science field? Or can we use that for, or, or some, for some evidence uh, of a consciousness, do you think? Yeah, I think we can, but <laughs> there's still some... It's still not integrated in kind of in mainstream uh, academic research, but there has been done s serious research, and and specifically on this, uh, as is what was called the Aware Study, and I think they, then it was published in th 2015 in that paper, and they they continued it, and I think they they'll be publishing the next batch of results soon, or have perhaps just published. And they are doing very serious work on this, but their approach is not what is the nature of reality. Their approach is um, it's, it's within a medical framework. So they say, how do we treat patients here? So mm. when patients have cardiac arrest and we resurrect them, well, what to do then? Because it looks like, according to their research, that um, people are experiencing something and in few cases, it seems like that experiences can be can be verified objectively that that they are actually, or at least in one case, actually experiencing things while their their brain is not functioning. And that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so it it has gained interest, and 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 this particular research result is very interesting because. Within a materialist framework, you would say, well, it's the brain that generates or creates consciousness and experience. So if the brain doesn't work, then experience is impossible. But it seems like we have a case here where there's no brain activity, uh, at least in parts of the brain that is assumed to generate consciousness. But in the same, at the same time, you could, you can, you can can determine the point in time there are verifiable experiences. And that's very interesting. But it's, it's only one single case, right? So they continued their, their studies. And, and I think the second batch of results, they are a bit 
less clear on this uh, subject, but we, we'll wait and we'll have to see. So, okay. So this it is very interesting, but it's still, it's, it, it conflicts with the paradigm or the basic assumption of materialism. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it it's, needs many, many more, uh, uh, cases before you can even think about uh, revidera what it called revising revising your, your paradigm yes I think but I think there's as I mentioned there is there is an opening there's pe people are also within the academic world up up more open now than they were 20 years ago I think but that that these results like that that we just talked about, and they would be very, uh, they would be very useful if you want to kind of broaden the perspective on the question of the nature of reality. Yeah, mm -hmm. and of course they probably they they try to explain it away in. Uh, yeah, actually, in in, uh, in the paper they are, but you can't say, hey, we really have found our materialism is just you know, cheap <laughs> like. What they just say it's. It's perplexing. They use the term perplexing. Yeah. So so they even have one sentence and they say, you know, within the common, I don't remember the exact wording, but within the framework of the common assumptions, this is perplexing. But that's a pretty big thing. But yeah. it, it means, you know, we, this is, we don't understand. So we, can't, we can't really <laughs> explain this. And perhaps our assumptions are even wrong. So, but that's a, as far as you can go because they want the paper to be published and even to, Include an example like that is uh, somewhat controversial. Yeah. Mm. But there were many um, examples of that kind of thing in Bruce Grayson's book yeah. after. Yeah. Many well-documented examples. Yes. But the, the, the difference here is that usually in this kind of research, it's, it's retrospective. So you uh, talk to people that had an experience, but at least... Ideal, ideally, when when you do science, you you say, all right, I, I want to test this hypothesis, so I do this experiment, and then I'll see if the results match or not. So you have to you have to set up the experiment beforehand, and then you get the results, and then you can validate or you know, falsify or verify. Uh, so so methodically, this is this study here is, a, is better because. Um, you get the result in a controlled environment and as a part of a study uh, as opposed to talking to people who had an experience at some point. Mm. So mm. it's not to say that Grayson is wrong, it's just to say that methodically uh, it's questionable from a method. Yeah, 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 with that, yeah, I think tradition is really would, yeah, a lot of Chris. Mm. But it must be very hard to do uh, yes. controlled uh, yes. trials yes. Um, with near-death experiences because yes. you'd have to attempt to kill people. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's your problem. so that's a big problem. Yeah. And I think, yeah, they were, they were asking, and, and perhaps it was like 15 hospitals or something over several years, perhaps four years. I don't recall the exact numbers, but there were thousands of patients that had cardiac arrest and that were resurrected. Re there was resuscitated. Resuscitated. Yeah. 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 And there was only one case because a lot of them they died perhaps or they were in such a poor condition that they couldn't really talk to them and do the mm. interviews and stuff. Mm. Uh, and some people perhaps didn't want to talk about it. So there was only one case that could be verified out of mm. thousands of yeah resuscitation. But uh, Pim van Lommel, the the um, Dutch cardiologist has done a lot of research. He's written a book, Beyond Consciousness, isn't that, isn't that what it's called? I think so. Um, I'm not sure. Where he he was so fascinated by uh, the stories his patients told him, the ones he had resuscitated, that so many of them came back with these uh, stories of experiencing life when they were technically dead. So he began to, to uh, write the stories down and then do research into it. They uh, had uh, the it's, yeah, and he he made the first, um, like the breakthrough paper. It was published in a serious scientific uh, journal, um, 
Uh, I've forgotten the name, of it, but yeah, yeah, that's right. And he made this study, a Dutch, a Dutch mm. study. Yeah. And I, I, I talked to him once, and he said actually uh, about the the West study paper that I uh, we just talked about. Mm. They were not at first. They were not going to include the the case because it was just a single case, and usually it's not it's not enough if you only have one case. But then he said, hey, include it anyway because this is so interesting. And then they did, and then they got published. And, and it is a very interesting case because it's, it contradicts the, it's, it's, it's not, it, it, it straight out contradicts materialism. Um, mm. It seems at least. So, so yeah. in, in the future, it, it will appear, I, I suppose, uh, some sort of hard facts mm. that we can rely on. Mm. And but that, yeah, that's the, yeah. That's what is needed, I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So more of those kind of studies. Mm. Um, but at least I did these are big studies. Uh, several years and many hospitals and thousands of patients. So if they can get the um, the funds for it, the funding, they will I think they will continue on that direction. Mm. Um, yeah. So and, and and that research was what triggered my interest in, in all this stuff. Yeah. And so I think it's very fast. So perhaps I could ask if um, studying Martinus has changed your view of consciousness. How, how do you view consciousness after studying Martinus's works? Yeah, so there's the, uh, what would you say, I don't know, theoretical view or how I view things from a more theoretical perspective perhaps, but then also the personal perspective. Mm. And I'm not sure that I'm convinced by his theoretical arguments a hundred percent but I as I said his thoughts just resonate with me in a way so if I were to to make my best how would you say best bit or what I think is the most likely <laughs> description of the nature of reality I'm probably Point to materials, right? So it's the best, it's the best uh, model I've seen. And personally, I uh, it it appears true to me, but I I still need a bit. Mm -hmm. It has some weaknesses if you try to test this real view. If, if you kind of test it in tap, we yeah. say. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. That. But if you kind of push it, there are some weaknesses in his arguments, but it feels true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just a personal. Yeah. You can use that as an, in a paper, of course, right? But uh, yeah. So I try to live my life and, uh, as much as I can according with this. But he, basically, what he says is, you know, be a good person, right? And then it, it's. You would find that uh, you many places. So I think it's it has some merit to it. <laughs> and you believe in reincarnation? You, yeah, you yes, find well, it uh, prob probably. Prob yeah, prob yeah, prob yeah, prob I, yeah, my students they ask me sometimes because sometimes I talk to them about you know, some of this stuff. And when they say, "Oh, what do you believe in?" And they say, "Ah, I don't want to believe." Oh, you are a scientist. <laughs> I think. It could be possible. It's more likely that reincarnation is true than it is not, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so when they ask me, do you believe in life after death? I say, well, I don't know, but perhaps 80%. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, that's that's pretty I, I much. Think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it has a lot more substance than people usually uh, assume. Yeah. And I think it's just the. they are... Um, a substan substantial or substantive arguments supporting this. And and they are there are much stronger arguments that than what is or perhaps the arguments supporting the opposite views, the views of materialism, are are not as strong as people are sure. Mm. So so the view of materialism is much less well grounded than what is usually assumed. Mm. So I would my best a suggestion, a regulation, but I think that Matthias's world uh, picture is the best. The best. How would you say in, in the best the best. The best bit. 
Best bet. Yeah, the best bet. <laughs> that was a bet. It's more like um, no gambling. So. <laughs> no, 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 like, yeah. no. But, uh, but the best the, hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, and I think so. Yeah, but on an existential level, I I find this very satisfying. Um, mm-hmm. So I've kind of <laughs> yeah, I'm um, yeah, I'm I'm um, not accepted it, but I. I really like it, and I try to live as if it. It's a, no. <laughs> I think that's that's a that's a great yeah, uh, yeah the I, way of thinking. I think yeah, one yeah. argument Martin Martinus comes with that um, I like very much was the argument for eternal life, and that is that the experience of life depends on contrast. That you can't experience anything unless it forms a contrast with what you to what you experienced before. And if you accept that, then that could never have been a first experience. So therefore life is eternal. So so I find eternal life a rather easy thing to accept. The mechanics of it, birth, rebirth, uh, birth, uh, death, rebirth, and so on, that's another step. But uh, I find I'm totally convinced about eternal life because I actually experienced something. I couldn't experience it if there wasn't an experience before. And I had to meet an experience before that and before that and before that. So there could never have been a first experience. That was, that blew me. Uh, that that was, um, yeah, that made so much sense to me. So I became totally con- convinced that I was an eternal being. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, usually when you talk about contrast, it's, if I see, if I have a single experience that I can see this color, that color, I, I can't, to even be able to uh, perceive a specific color, uh, that requires that there are different colors, right? So there has to be contrast within the, sim- the single uh, image I experience. But yeah, it's an interesting argument that it also, it also, Mm. happens across time that you have to have a contrast a previous experience have to contrast the experience you are having at the moment you know? hmm. you can think about that one yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've heard it before <laughs> oh yeah it is an interest yeah. well Mary time flies when you're time is flying fun, when you're having so. fun yes so, Nicola, do you have any future plans for research or teaching or working more with these ideas? Or what? Um, yeah, I'm, I, uh, I'm have, yeah, I have my full-time job teaching, so I have my kids are uh, there four and eight, so I'm getting a bit more spare time, but I don't have that much time. And I'm doing uh, videos, YouTube videos. I've, I've started, I don't know, half a year ago or something, perhaps a bit more on an English uh, English language channel, would you say? Yeah. yeah. A channel with, with video things and scripted videos. So they have been bought. <laughs> to us. But it, it's, it, they were a bit more smooth than today. Yeah. Um, and it takes some time because I have to do the scripts and all this stuff. Uh, but, and then I am, um, yeah. The writing, um, I've been asked to write some chapters to a book uh, and um, have, yeah, I plan to do perhaps more lectures in the future or something. So it's not academic work, just uh, just at the moment. Good. Yes. So thank you very much, Nikolai, for taking all the time to come from Jutland to Clint to, uh, to take part in this podcast. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah, th- thank you thank very you much. Thank you, from for joining us from Stockholm. Yeah, well, I was here in a way. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. Thank you.